Hey guys, so today we are going to be working on food management systems and we're also going to then take a look at safe facilities and pest management. So before we get started up, we're going to go and take another look over at another episode of Dirty Restaurant from WBT, just so we can take a look and see some of these real world problems coming up. Well, I have some really low scores here for some restaurants oh, no. that did not do well when the health inspector showed up. First one is on Monroe Road, Captain Steve Seafood. Oh, wow. Been there for a long time. Yeah. 85. Ouch. And a half. <laughs> Repeat violation. No one there with any food safety training. <laughs> the usual suspect. That's right. Uh, observed a server using bare hands to put an onion on a salad for a customer. And there's, the inspector's like, stop. Throw the salad away and Please. learn to use tongs. Oh, my God. <laughs> you want an onion with that honey? Here, let me scrap it for you. <laughs> wow. Uh, observe no soap at the server's hand sink. Oh, yeah. that's a pretty important step. That's yeah, right. Made it even worse than yeah. watching the server in dirty hands. That was a repeat violation, by the way. Uh, observe unpacked raw beef burgers and raw chopped beef steak with the uncovered cooked okra and the cooked crab just all stored together. Oh. Wow, oh, that's that's not a good flavor profile either. <laughs> no, it's not. This crab tastes like raw meat. <laughs> uh, can opener with multiple days of dried food built up on it. Ouch. Oh, that just sounds nasty. Oh. It? And some kind of nasty slime in the ice machine as well. I feel like we used to see that a lot more than we have lately. Yeah, we haven't seen a lot oh, of that lately. People aren't eating in as often as much, so maybe they are Observed prepared stuffed crabs that were partially cooked, and then they put them under a hot holding lamp, hoping to finish cooking them there. No! Yeah! It's I'm holding, <laughs> not cooking. <laughs> yeah, wow. just put those under that hot lamp. It feels hot to me. Uh, then they had some uh, foods that uh, had to be discarded that had been cooling in the back unit overnight, but were still at the uh, wrong temperature. Ew. Uh, multiple containers of house-made sauces and dressings were several days old. Uh, whose house were they made of? <laughs> yeah, good question. That's another question. So, uh, just a lot of problems at Captain Steve's Seafood on Monroe Road, 85.5. Hard pass. Yeah, I know. Now we have something that's never happened before. Two locations of the same restaurant, both with crummy scores. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, first of all, it's the Ichiban. We've had these guys on. Oh, uh, yeah. The Ichiban Buffet and Sushi on Albemarle Road at 87. Oh. And the one on Queen City Drive had an 82. Oh, oh. Wow. So Ichiban oh. is a mess no matter where you go. Uh, the one on Albemarle Road, not much hand washing observed today. The inspector writes right at the top. Uh, one employee was observed handling dirty dishes, then attempted to handle clean dishes without washing. Observed people leaving the kitchen and coming back and starting to handle food and not wash. <laughs> and it was a repeat violation. Uh, employee observed uh, with uh, gloves, touching a trash can, and then just not bothering change gloves and start oh, handling food. No! Oh, that is nasty, oh. isn't it? Cut cabbage, shrimp, and sliced tomatoes were uh, sitting way too warm on the prep line. Oh. And they had a number of other foods uh, that had no date on them at all. Chicken wings, uh, cooked veggies, cut cabbage, crab meat, hot dogs, etc. And that was a repeat violation. Oh. So, oh, and employees had their jackets, aprons, and drinks all sitting on the prep surface. Just put your jacket there. <laughs> yeah, so. Ichiban uh, Buffet and Sushi on Avalon Road in 87. Now, the other Ichiban Sushi Bar and Buffet uh, on Queen City Drive had an 82 and a half. Uh, uh, the uh, person in charge there had no control of this facility. <laughs> 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 that, that's a great line. Yeah. Uh, observe that employee handle raw food and then handle customers ready to eat food without ever washing or putting on gloves. Uh, observe the house special egg rolls sitting in a large tub from the day before. They were still cooling and still at the wrong temperature. <laughs> Can we interest you in our house special egg roll? It's been sitting in a tub for days. <laughs> oh, and then they had uh, some other items below Maine, that house special egg roll and some other that were quickly given a different date when the inspector came. Oh, oh. interesting. Uh, and, and they do have a buffet there, and it said sushi and hibachi stations. Uh, they weren't keeping up with the time of how long the food. Oh, 
Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the inside of the dishwashing machine was nasty too. You don't see that very often. <laughs> that's supposed to clean your dishes. <laughs> if it's yeah, that's not gonna work. Uh, that's the Ichiban Sushi and Hibachi Buffet on Queen Street Drive at eighty two to go along with the other Ichiban on Albemarle Road that had an eighty seven. Just uh, bypass those. Yeah, or Pepto Bismol. <laughs> You're definitely going to need it. Ask for those. How special egg roll? Yeah, you avoid the special anywhere right? <laughs> is what I've learned from this segment. Taking a look at those three restaurants, we're just looking at an absolute disaster. So we have problems with not properly trained managers with food safety training, um, having the ready-to-eat foods with uh, being handled with bare hands, no soap at the hand sinks, which just sets off the, the health inspectors because they know if you have the bad habit of not properly washing your hands, there's probably other ones that are, that are underneath and they're going to dig them out. Um, incorrect fridge storage. As we know, we have our ready-to-eat foods up at the top of our refrigerator, then directly below there, that's where we have seafood. Then we go down to whole steaks, pork chops, things like that. Then underneath that, we go to our ground meats. And then right at the very bottom is our poultry. If you have things out of order, if you have things that are going to cross-contaminate, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, and then having dirty equipment and ice machines with pink slime or black slime in them, that, that again just tells the inspector that you are not properly attending to things because it takes a long time to build up that mold in there uh, in a cold environment of, a, of a, an ice machine. It's just, there's just no excuse for it. Time and temperature abuse this is a consistent problem. And it should be something that we are consistently taking care of. Um, and then having contamination of clean equipment. And then date marking. This is really a dangerous thing to start playing with. Because the reason why we're given seven days, uh, including the day that we open a product or we create a product, to actually use it up and get it out the door or it has to go in the trash, is just to make sure that we are not going to put our customers in harm's way. Let's dive right in now with food safety management systems. The food safety management systems are a group of practices and procedures that are intended to prevent foodborne illness. So this actively controls risks and hazards throughout our flow of food that we've already been studying. Let's take a look at what our management system, our, management, our food safety management system will entail. So we have personal hygiene programs. These ones should be easy, but we do need to make sure our staff understand. Food safety training programs. So this is including our uh, management training program right here, but it can also be something where a business should really encourage all of their employees to go through the Serve Safe Food Handler level, just so that everyone in the business has at least a basic understanding of expectations. And on top of that, the training should never stop. So it shouldn't happen that you have uh, just one-off training and then that's, they're good for the next few years. It should be a constant conversation. Any staff meetings you have, daily lineup meetings, things like that, there should be discussions happening on at least one or two items just to keep food safety at the forefront of everyone's mind. Supplier selection and specification program, this is where you must make sure that all of your suppliers are approved, reputable suppliers, that they're licensed, that they are insured, so that they have safe uh, food systems going through their programs too. Quality control and assurance programs, that's what the managers are there for, to make sure that every step of the way things are not missed, they're not done incorrectly, that food is produced safely. Cleaning and sanitation programs, just having those types of protocols in place um, are, are absolutely imperative. Standard operating procedures are the way that we do things like this. So one of the biggest uh, 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 standard operating procedures that we have in the kitchen are our recipes, right? We follow those step by step getting all of our ingredients on mise en place together and then working our way through. Other standard operating procedures for food safety management would include things like how do we clean a table correctly? When you first came into culinary arts, you didn't understand everything you needed to do every time we clean and sanitize a table. But now you understand we, we get rid of any of the debris, then we clean it with a detergent, and then we rinse with water, potable clean water, and then we go over the table with, uh, with sanitizer, at the correct solution rate and we allow it to dry so we have that contact time 
to kill off all the mold, viruses, and bacteria that may be on that table. Facility design and equipment maintenance programs. This is key and critical to making sure that you have a good linear flow going straight through your kitchen to make sure that you're not re uh, reinfecting your kitchen at any given time um, with uh, unsafe food situations. But then also making sure that your things like your refrigerators are working correctly. Um, make sure that all of your equipment is maintained properly. Um, and if anything needs to be repaired, that it's done by a professional. And then pest control programs. We're going to talk more about these later on as well. It's imperative that you don't try and attempt this kind of stuff by yourself. You have to have an expert if you need to be controlling pest problems. However, there are things that we can and should do every day. And that's making sure that we don't have any openings where, where bugs and animals can get into our establishment. And then on top of that, making sure that we have a clean and well-maintained facility so that we don't give any food, beverages, and safe harbor for any of these pests either. When you wipe those out of the way, then it's amazing how quickly pest problems can be evaporated away. A cook forgot to wash his uniform before starting work. Could this cause foodborne illness? Absolutely. If I come to work and I have a dirty chef uniform and dirty chef coat, I could definitely contaminate any food that comes in contact with my uniform, or if a worst case scenario, if I have literally food dropping off my uniform um, into our fresh food, we could definitely cause some problems. Chicken breast was cooked to 165 Fahrenheit. Could this cause a foodborne illness? Oh, no. 165 is exactly where we should be cooking our chicken breast and all of our poultry foods too to eradicate any foodborne illness possibilities. A cook served rice at 120 degrees Fahrenheit from a hot holding unit. Could this cause a foodborne illness? Absolutely, yes. This could definitely cause a problem because it's currently in the temperature danger zone. 135 is the top of the temperature danger zone, so 120 is actually right in the middle of where bacteria love to be, and they will be growing like wildfire. We need to make sure we keep food at 135 or above when we are hot holding it. If this food has just, um, in a short period of time, gone down into the temperature danger zone, we can reheat it. We would need to reheat it back up to 165 to ensure that we're killing any bacteria off. And then after that, we would need to maintain it at 135 or above. The problem that we may have then, if the food is not kept um, at the correct temperature and then has to be reheated, we can start finding that food quality issues can come in where we actually um, damage the quality of the food because it's been reheated so many times. Manager brought steaks raised and sold from a private home. Could this be a foodborne illness? Absolutely. If it's not from a reputable, approved supplier, we cannot trust it. We don't necessarily know that this, uh, this company or this person in their home um, uh, did everything that they should have. Uh, in raising, slaughtering, and processing any of these, uh, any of this meat and these steaks, so we can't trust it. A cutting board was used to prep fish and then fruit salad. Could this cause a foodborne illness? Absolutely. We're now looking at the possibility of cross contamination between the fish and then the fruit salad. We definitely would. It would be preferable for us to use a separate chopping board for these two different tasks. Focuses on controlling the five most common risk factors for foodborne illness are definitely a part of a management control system. So purchasing foods from unsafe sources is a problem. Failing to cook the food correctly is a problem. Holding the food at incorrect temperatures inside the temperature danger zone can be lethal. Using contaminated equipment can just cause all sorts of problems as well as practicing, practicing poor personal hygiene. There are many ways to achieve an active managerial control in our operation. So this involves our training programs. So making sure that our managers are trained and our employees are trained and having continual training throughout the shifts when they're working so they understand the importance and they maintain the, uh, the standards that we expect. Having manager supervision to make sure that all of those things are appropriately done constantly. Incorporation of a standard operating procedures 
um, a guide map is a good thing to do as well because making sure that everybody understands that there are no gray areas when it comes to food safety that it's black and white we have to do the things that we need to do to keep food safe no matter what and then HACCP hazard analysis with critical control points we're going to go more in depth on this uh, but this is where all the way through uh, when the food comes from the farmer to the distributor to our back door in the kitchen and then all the way through all of our processes of storage preparation cooking and um, possible chilling and then restorage we have to make sure that we keep our food safe at every point in that process here we have a great um, example of a HACCP plan, hazard analysis with critical control point plan for a restaurant. Every restaurant is going to have its own one because they each have their own major critical control points. But this is a great example of a broad HACCP plan. So it's a flowchart. So we start at the top with everything that comes in through our back door. So we purchase and receipt are right, in receipt of all of our goods, whether it's frozen storage goods chilled storage goods or ambient storage goods, ambient being uh, dry storage at uh, room temperature. So let's take a look at each of these different flows as they go through. So when we purchase, we purchase from a reputable approved supplier to make sure that what's coming in is safe right from the start. So we purchase our frozen food, it has to then be inspected, check for temperature, check for quality, check for quantity, and then immediately stored to maintain uh, that frozen state. We then, if we're going to uh, use that food, we're either going to thaw it, say if it's a turkey, we would have to make sure that we thaw it across time. So we'd have to allow possibly days for a large 15 or 20 pound turkey to go into uh, a refrigerator to allow it slowly defrost, or we could put it under, uh, under slow running water, um, not more than 70 degrees to slowly defrost it um, in that situation. It can go into a microwave to defrost, although that giant turkey may not work out so well in a giant in a microwave. And then also, it can be part of the cooking process. So that's where we can go from frozen storage Im immediately to preparation or cooking, to things like burgers that we may purchase frozen, and they go straight onto the grill still frozen. We then go into, uh, if we have a look at the chill storage, as soon as the food comes in, say if we have eggs, we're allowed to receive those eggs at up to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, once, once we've um, made sure that they are safe, that they are the appropriate temperature, the, the right number, the right quality, the right quantity, then we can go ahead and put them in the refrigerator. Within four hours, we want to chill them down to 41 Fahrenheit or below. And then we can go ahead and prepare them and cook them if we wish. And then we go on to ambient storage. Again, making sure it's reputable approved suppliers that are, that are selling these to us making sure that the cans are clean, they're not damaged, they're not bowing out, they haven't been dented uh, to where they could cause um, any kind of contamination, either from the metal of the can or from, uh, or from outside if it's been pierced at all. And then we can go ahead and prepare and cook those products as well. Every step of the way that we're seeing through here, these are all critical control points. Things can go horribly wrong. I could take that frozen turkey and just leave it out on the counter. So those legs for the last few hours of their defrosting time will actually be at room temperature. Bacteria will be growing like crazy on there, whilst the core may still be frozen, but we're not maintaining the temperature. Um, same with our frozen products. If we're taking things out and not defrosting them, or our chilled products, if we're taking too many chickens out from a refrigerator to try and start um, breaking down and fabricating, we could have some of that chicken sitting out in the refrigerator for an hour or more, while we're preparing several at a time. We are safer by not doing that, by taking one out at a time, maintaining that temperature. With our ambient storage, we want to make sure that when we open that product that it's safe, and then after that, we don't allow any cross-contamination to happen, make sure it's appropriately stored. We don't store foods in the original cans. We put them into food-safe containers, and make sure that they're, that they're wrapped. A lot of these foods will need to be refrigerated after they've been opened, so if we're not using them, cooking them immediately, then we would have to refrigerate them. Now, as we work our way down, you can see farther down where we get to cooking, assembling, and possibly chilling if we're not using that food immediately. 
and making sure that as we chill it down, we refrigerate, we get it down to refrigerated temperatures rapidly. So remember, a hot, hot food item must be cooled down through from 135 down to 70 within two hours. And then after that, you've got four more hours to get it down to refrigerated temperature. We have lots of methods. We've already talked about how we do that, but we must do that. If we fail to chill it from, uh, from 135 down to 70 in those two hours, the only alternative we have to throwing it away is to reheat it back up to 165 and attempt it again. But obviously, again, your food product quality is going to be diminished every time you're reheating and chilling, reheating and chilling. So make sure you do it right the first time. Then when we cook things, we may be serving it immediately. That's the best case scenario. Or we may have to chill it and possibly freeze it again. Make sure we're doing that appropriately. Um, so that all the way through, until it gets to our customer, the food is always safe. So active man uh, managerial control is going to help us to keep our food safe. With practicing active managerial control throughout the flow of food, as we just looked at with our hazard plan. We anticipate potential foodborne illness risk factors and control or eliminate them altogether. Apply what you have learned in ServeSafe every day and make sure that you talk to your employees so that they can do the same. Monitor the flow of food and provide staff with the proper tools to make sure that food is safe. Making sure we have procedures, training and quality equipment so that they have everything they need. To implement active managerial control, we have to identify those risks, we monitor them, we make corrective action to them, we make sure we have management oversight at all times. We are constantly doing training and more training and more training and then re-evaluating the whole program to see if things need to be changed. Identifying these risks involves finding and documenting potential foodborne illness risks in the operation identifying the hazards that can be control or con controlled or eliminated. Monitor them. Food will be safe if managers monitor critical activities throughout our HACCP um, flowchart. Identify where employees must monitor food safety requirements, when temperatures must be taken, how often sanitizer concentrations should be tested. Corrective actions that we can take include taking appropriate steps to correct improper procedures or behaviors. If a sanitizer, a sanitizer level is too low, increase the concentration level. Management oversight will involve verifying that all policies, procedures, and corrective actions are followed at all times. Training. This ensures that employees are trained to follow the procedures and being retrained when necessary, and this should just be a constant ongoing thing. Re-evaluating the whole program periodically um, to make sure that the system is working correctly and efficiently. The FDA provides recommendations for controlling the common risk factors for foodborne illness. Now let's just go over that one more time. The FDA provides recommendations for controlling the common risk factors for foodborne illness. The FDA does not create laws. The FDA creates a food, a food code for us to be able to then understand and use every day in our kitchen. The laws and the inspections are carried out by the individual states and individual municipalities. Always understand that. The federal government makes recommendations. The state and local government are the ones that enforce the laws. So this is all about demonstration of knowledge, staff health controls, controlling hands as a vehicle of contamination, time and temperature parameters for controlling pathogens and not creating time and temperature abuses, and consumer advisories too. The HACCP approach is based on identifying significant biological, chemical, or physical hazards at specific points within the product's flow through an operation, as we saw on our flowchart. Once identified, hazards can be prevented, eliminated entirely, or at least reduced to safe levels. To be an effective HACCP system, it must be based on a written plan. And so this is why it's important, because every operation is different from one another. It must be specific to each facility, for their menu, their customers, the equipment, processes, and operation. A plan that works for one may not work for another. We're going to take a look now at a safety audit video. 
This one focuses somewhat on food preparation and food uh, items, but it also looks at the entire business. We should be carrying out safety audits in our operations all the time to make sure that when that health inspector does come in, that they only see good things happening, that we've already identified problems and we're identifying them so we can correct them. The purpose of a general safety audit is to judge the level of safety in the operation. It is an inspection of all the parts of the operation, facilities, equipment, and employee and management practices. A general safety audit identifies any areas or practices that might be hazardous to employees and guests. An inspector will use a checklist to perform the safety audit and will mark any unsafe issues that need to be addressed and repaired. One way to prepare for a safety audit is by performing regular self-inspections. This helps ensure all employees are using correct safety practices throughout the operation. The safety audit covers four general areas. The first area is the facility. This includes the exterior and interior of the physical building structure and also things like the plumbing and electricity. Inspect outside areas like drive through windows, parking lots, and outdoor eating areas. Inside the building, look at the furnishings. This includes booths, tables, and chairs, as well as fixtures like sinks, lights, and doors. The next area safety audit covers is equipment. All equipment must meet the legal standards for food service equipment. Check to find the stamp of approval by either the National Sanitation Foundation or Underwriters Laboratories. Things like cooking and cutting equipment, refrigerators, tools, vehicles, fire extinguishers, and alarms all must be maintained in acceptable working condition, which basically means check equipment regularly to make sure nothing can harm or injure an employee during use. If equipment needs repair, the employees who use the equipment must tell the team and their supervisor. If a piece of equipment poses a hazard, then it should be turned off. A certified technician is the only person qualified to repair equipment and determine that it is safe to use again. The next area of the audit is employee practices. This means that managers must train employees in safe practices and then supervise them to make sure employees use these practices on the job. Training includes the proper use of work equipment. Using equipment incorrectly can lead to equipment problems and potential injuries. The last area to inspect is management practices. This is basically how committed management is to protecting employees and guests. It includes identifying potential hazards to employees and guests and providing warnings to prevent injury, like putting out wet floor signs to prevent falls. It also means doing whatever is necessary to make the operation safe, like keeping sidewalks free and clear of ice and snow, even during a blizzard. When violations or accidents occur, it can mean that the safety program needs improvement. Employees should only do the jobs they have been trained for and are physically able to do. Employees should be updated and retrained whenever new pieces of equipment are purchased or major aspects of the operation change. A strong safety program can lower operating costs, increase profitability, and raise the overall quality of the dining experience. Keep a close eye on safety by performing regular self-inspections. Safety is critical to employee and customer satisfaction. Now we're moving on to safe facilities and pest management. What do you think? Should you consult with your local regulatory authority before making changes to your facility or equipment? Absolutely, yes you should. They're actually a great uh, resource to be able to use because they know all of the laws and things you can and cannot do and the reasons for it too. Rather than spending thousands of dollars possibly making uh, large changes to facilities or equipment and making the mistake and then having to replace them afterwards, check with them. They can help you out making good decisions. So interior requirements for a safe operation involve looking at our floors, walls, and ceilings. They must be regularly maintained, replacing missing or broken ceiling tiles, replacing missing or broken flooring, and repairing holes in the walls to not allow things to be able to come into our facility 
that we haven't invited. Making sure that we glue any coving tightly to the walls and removing standing water immediately after spraying or flushing floors during our cleaning processes. Ever seen this logo before? You should have if you've been in our kitchen or any other professional kitchen. So this, uh, this one is actually all about showing that it's safe for use with food. The NSF creates national standards for equipment and is accredited by the American National Standards Institute. Equipment that you use that has the NFF, NSF logo on it will show you that it's easy to clean and that it's very durable. These are very important things to have in all of our equipment in a professional kitchen. Installing and maintaining equipment is critical to making sure that you have a success with it. When you install the equipment, make sure you follow the manufacturer's recommendation. Check with the regulatory authority for specific requirements that you may need to have with that equipment, like refrigeration or freezer temperatures. Once the equipment has been installed, it must be maintained regularly. Only qualified people should maintain it, meaning that um, you may know exactly how to clean and sanitize a refrigerator, but if something starts playing up on it, something starts going wrong, have a professional come in to take care of it to make sure that you don't start creating more problems. Set up a maintenance schedule with your supplier or manufacturer and then check, with the, uh, check the equipment regularly to make sure that it's working correctly. When dishwashers washers are installed, they must be installed correctly so that they are reachable and conveniently located in a way that it keeps utensils, equipment and other food contact surfaces from being contaminated. Make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions. We've actually um, listened in on WBT's Dirty Restaurant episodes sometimes where the dishwasher will be dirty on the inside, that the health inspector actually tells them that they have to clean it before they can continue using it. Make sure that your dishwasher is properly installed so that it is convenient and easy to clean, that there aren't any strange angles within the actual setup um, that mean that you can't reach it properly to clean it properly. This is vital because if your dishwasher is not clean, it will not clean other things. When selecting the dishwasher, make sure that the detergents and sanitizers used are approved by the local regulatory authorities, that they have the ability to, be, to measure the water, temperature, water pressure, and cleaning and sanitizing chemical concentrations. The information about the correct settings should be posted on the machine too. This is something that very often these, these suppliers for your chemicals can help you with. Most of them will have people on their staff who are trained to actually, um, to actually correctly set up your machine, to have it uh, correctly set so that it pulls the correct, correct amounts of these chemicals so that you're using them correctly, you're not overusing them and possibly causing chemical problems or underusing them and possibly having issues of, uh, food, of uh, food, uh, food systems and equipment not being cleaned properly before use. Is this hand washing station being used correctly? That's a lot of boxes all in the way. This is not going to be working properly for us. So, no, we need to get those boxes out of the way. You never block your hand washing sinks, otherwise they won't be used. Is this hand washing station being used correctly? Well, no. Hand washing station is not for washing equipment, it's not for defrosting fish, it's not for doing anything else, putting plates in or anything like that, it's for washing hands. Nothing else should ever go into that sink. Is this hand washing station being used correctly? Yes it is. So we have um, a guard on, on the side here which creates an adequate barrier or, or you need to have an adequate amount of spacing to prevent, prevent any splashing onto foods or contact, uh, food contact surfaces to make sure that none of that soapy hand water goes onto any food products. But everything else is correctly set up in there as well, it has even the sign that tells the employee to make sure they're washing their hands. Is this hand washing station being used correctly? Let's take a look. We have the soap, we have the hand towels to dry our hands, we've got this sink. No, there's something missing. We don't have a garbage can there to be able to put those uh, those pieces of hand towel into the trash afterwards. Hand washing stations must have hot and cold running water that meets the temperature and pressure requirements 
and it also should be drinkable. It should be potable water so that way we're not contaminating our hands whilst trying to wash them and then contaminating food after we've washed them in that sink. Make sure you have liquid, bar or powdered soap available at all times and have a way to be able to dry your hands. That can be disposable towels or a continuous towel system or it can be a hand dryer with warm air or room temperature air delivered at high velocity. You should also have your garbage container for those paper towels and the signage to remind people you wash your hands and you wash them correctly. Utilities. We should have adequate supplies of water, electricity, gas, sewage, and garbage disposal. Requirements for our utilities must, must meet that they have enough, enough of all these things to be able to supply our system without undue stress. Must make sure that utilities and systems work correctly to minimize the risk of contamination occurring. Is it okay to install plumbing yourself? No, it is not. Always have a professional plumber that would come in to correctly set everything up and make sure that you, are, uh, that you have only a licensed plumber installing any of these products so that we know that everything is safely and correctly set up so we avoid contamination. We're going to talk more about that kind of thing in a few minutes. Possible water. What is that? It's drinkable water. Only possible water can be used to prepare food and come in contact with food contact surfaces so that we don't create contamination when we're trying to clean things as well. Now let's talk about one of the most important plumbing things that we have in our kitchen, the backflow issues. So a reverse flow of contaminants through a cross connection into the possible water supply is what we call backflow. Now, what exactly does that mean? Because that's a, that's a big long sentence there that says a lot of different things. So this is where we can have backflow can be the result of pressure pushing contaminants back into the water supply. When you turn a tap on, then the water comes out nice and freely. When you turn the tap back off, it should just immediately stop the water in its tracks and the pressure should maintain behind that tap to stop anything from flowing backwards. However, we, we work in different situations. We may have a building um, that we work in that's only a couple of years old and has no problems with backflow uh, issues because everything, all the plumbing is correctly set up and it's all brand new. You may work in a building similar to our career center that's 60 something years old. And our, our plumbing system was put in for one purpose and has been altered over time to allow for additional things. We have to make sure that we have everything set up so that we don't allow any kind of back siphonage to occur. So a vacuum in the, in the plumbing system created when high water use in one area of the operation can actually suck contaminants back into the water supply. It's called back siphonage and that's what can cause contamination in all of our, in all of our food products from our water supply. So let's, let's not stop talking about backflow for just a moment yet. But what's the best way to prevent backflow occurring? Is it to install a vacuum breaker? Is it to install a reduced pressure zone backflow preventer? Or is it to avoid creating a cross-connection cross -connection in the first place? Well, let's see. Because you don't, you, know, you don't want to create any cross-connection unless if you cannot avoid it. A cross connection means that instead of just having one water supply going directly to each of your sinks, each of your water needs around your facility, is that someone has made a cross connection, an additional a splitter that actually now makes that one water supply supply more than one thing. So this could be, for an example, that we have a hose that's out of the back of the hotel or out of the back of the restaurant that's used to spray down the trash cans. That supply was split off a few years back and that's because it originally came from one of our food preparation sinks and it was just plumbed in as a cross connection. Everything's fine until we actually turn on that hose, we spray down one of our trash cans to get it nice and clean, then when we turn off that tap, some of that water gets siphoned back into the water supply because it didn't shut off 
abruptly enough and, and fully enough. So it allowed for some of that um, water to be siphoned back in from the hose pipe. If you've ever had a hose pipe um, in the middle of summer that you've been under where it's spraying around, the water that comes from there can kind of taste a little musty, a little moldy. That's because most hose pipes, um, once they're used, they will never be dry on the inside. They're always going to have some moisture in them. So, and in the summertime, if they're sitting out in a nice warm um, warmth on the outside, then they will guaranteed be growing bacteria, mold, fungi, all sorts of things in there that could cause problems if they go back into our water system. When you spray everything down with that hose pipe, you turn it off and some of that water then siphons back into the water system and then someone turns on the food preparation sink, unknowingly drawing some of that back backflowed water into our food preparation sink we could now be causing contamination problems. So you do not attach a hose to a faucet unless a backflow prevention device is attached, such as a vacuum breaker. A vacuum breaker will stop this siphoning issue from happening. Mechanical devices for preventing back, uh, backflow include a vacuum breaker, a double check valve, and a reduced pressure zone backflow preventer, or an RPZ. Backflow de prevention devices must be checked periodically for proper function. They are a mechanical device that can fail. It should be checked by a trained and certified technician. The work must be documented to show that you've had this done, and it should be done according to local requirements and manufacturer's recommendations. Make sure you monitor the lighting all over your facility. Any bulbs that are burned out, they must be replaced immediately. Make sure that bulbs are the correct size, the correct wattage, um, so that that way the right number of lumens, so that you know that that way you're not going to have any shadows being cast, you're not going to have any dark areas anywhere in your facility that inhibit your ability to be able to clean properly and safely. There's a buildup of grease and condensation on the walls and ceilings. What's the problem? Is it the staff has not been clearly uh, clean, uh, not been cleaning adequately? Is it that the ventilation system is not working correctly, or is it that the grill is not being operated at a high enough temperature? It's the ventilation system that's not working correctly. If you ever have grease and condensation on the walls, that's exactly what our ventilation system should be drawing out immediately from uh, from above our cooking areas. If these aren't working properly, if they need to be cleaned or maintained. This is a telltale sign, although we shouldn't let it get to that stage before we maintain our ventilation system. Ventilation systems improve the air inside an operation. They remove the heat, steam, and smoke from our cooking lines. They must be cleaned and maintained according to manufacturer's recommendations all the time and consistently as well so that nothing can build up in them. Is this garbage can being handled correctly? Well, I'd say by the looks of it, by the by the way that this uh, employee has placed that trash can, trash bag up on top of the work table, that would be a no, because that, that trash container container has not been sanitized, it's not clean, and if that person now forgets to wash, rinse, and sanitize that table, we could be looking at cross contamination problems. Waste containers must be covered when not in constant use, indoor containers included. Women's restrooms must include a covered receptacle for sanitary napkins. They must, be, um, they must be stored separately from food and food contact surfaces, waste and recyclables, that is. Storage must not contain, can, can create a nuisance or a public health hazard either. To prevent food surf, uh, safety problems, we need to be cleaning the operation regularly. Make sure that building systems work and that they're checked regularly. Make sure that the building is sound, no leaks, holes, or cracks that can allow unwanted things coming in, and controlling pests. Maintaining the outside of the building is, is in, uh, incredibly important as well to make sure that we have control over everything. Anytime that you have emergencies in your facility, you, sh uh, you're, you may have an imminent health hazard. This is a significant threat to, or danger to health. It requires immediate correction or closure to prevent any injury. So possible imminent health hazards would include 
electrical power outages and refrigeration breakdowns, fire and flood, sewage backups, unauthorized people inside the facility, and then threats to the potable water supply either through a broken mains or possibly terrorist contamination. Pest control. This is an incredibly important thing for us to always understand. You have an integrated pest management IPM system that prevents and controls or eliminates all infestations. We should not be looking to do pest control by ourselves. We should always make sure we have an integrated pest management system to make sure that we are working on our side, but then we have a pest control operator as well working on our side too. We'll come back to them. So we should have prevention measures, making sure that we are controlling everything that is in our facility to prevent pests from entering by checking deliveries, make sure that the, the fruit doesn't have fruit flies on it, make sure there's no roaches in anything, make sure there's no mice hiding out in anything, screening windows and vents, especially if your kitchen is just ventilated through open windows and vents, making sure that you have correct screens over them so that we don't allow anything to get in. You wouldn't believe how small of a size hole it takes for a mouse, a rat, or any pests, any bugs to be able to get in. Keep exterior openings closed. On our back door um, for our, from our kitchen, we have one of the um, high, high pressure um, blowers above the door that creates a, uh, creates a curtain of blasting air. So that, that way, bugs don't like flying through turbulent air. It's very detrimental to their health. But so by us having that in place, it means that bugs don't want to come near our back door when our door is open. That's imperative to making sure that things don't come in. Keeping exterior open, openings closed, covering floor drains, making sure that any ceiling um, uh, is done on any cracks on our walls, our floors, or our ceilings, and then filling any other holes. We have three basic rules. Deny access. And then one big responsibility that we as chefs have. Deny food, water, hiding and nesting places as well for any pests. We do this all in, uh, in, in, in uh, transition with a licensed pest, con pest control operator, a PCO. You never try and just spray your own bug spray around to try and kill off uh, uh, rodents or pests. Because you may be spraying things down that can cause con uh, contamination into our foods from, uh, from chemicals. We have to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to keep our food safe. That includes making sure that we don't try and guess at these types of things. Have an integrated pest management system and always employ a licensed pest control operator to take care of business. Emergencies that can affect the facility. Um, this, well, this is how we're going to respond to a crisis that affects our facility. We need to determine if there is a significant risk to the safety and security of our food. If the risk is significant, we must stop service immediately. Notify the local regulatory authorities. Throw out any spoiled food, contaminated food, and food with packaging that's not intact. We can't guarantee its safety. Correcting our problems should include establishing time and temperature controls for TCS foods, time and temperature control for safety foods. Cleaning and sanitizing work surfaces and other surfaces in the operation. Re-establishing the physical security of the operation. Verifying that the water supply is now drinkable and gaining the approval of the local regulatory authority. Service may be allowed after a water or electrical in, uh, interruptions if the operation has the pre-approval and written emergency operating plans, that they take immediate corrective action when these things uh, fail, and that they notify the regulatory authority when the plan has been implemented. This is something that needs to be pre-done. It cannot be done after the fact. So if you don't have a pre-approved written emergency operational plan, then if, if you lose the water or power, then you have to shut down. 